Well, you may have noticed that uh, the seating is a little different. I've put you into kind of conversation pods, and you're not restricted to stay here, but I have a reading, and then I'm going to introduce some questions. The service today, the sermon today is the community questions, kind of based on the services that we've had for the last three weeks. So I have a few questions, and what I'm going to do is encourage you to discuss it for as long as it feels appropriate to you, maybe five or six minutes. I've got three questions, and then I'll wander around with the microphone in case there's anybody who really wants to answer one of those questions for the larger group, and we'll see what the collective wisdom holds. But before that, I came across a reading this week. I, um, I sit on the executive of our, of our Minister's Association in Canada, and one of my colleagues read this as the opening words for our meeting on Friday. It's called It Matters by Robert Walsh. I knew a man who had printed on his stationery a proverb. Nothing is settled Everything matters. It established a certain ambiance for reading his letters, as if to say, what you're about to read is to be taken seriously, but is not final. I remember him and his proverbs sometimes, especially when it seems impossible to change the world or myself in any significant way. Times like the beginnings of New Year's. Sorry, Jim, I say. It's not true that nothing is settled. In the past year, choices have been made. Losses have been suffered. There has been growth and decay. There have been commitments and betrayals. None of that can be undone. A year ago, no one knew whether during this year one person would become pregnant, another would get cancer, Another would take a new job. Another would have an accident. But now that is settled. One day this year, I was present just when someone needed me. And another day, I was busy doing something else when I was needed. One day, I said something to a friend that injured our relationship. But another day, I said something that enabled someone to see life in a new way. The best and worst of these days is now written. All my tears, sorrow, or joy cannot erase it. Now, if I stay with my meditation long enough, the reply comes. Robbie, says Jim, you've misunderstood the proverb. It is true that you cannot escape the consequences of your actions or the chances of the world. But what is not settled is how the story turns out. What is not settled is what the meaning of your life will be. The meaning of life is not contained within one act or one day or one year. As long as you are alive, the story of your life is still being told. And the meaning is still open. As long as there is life in the world, the story of the world is being told, just like in our everything seed story. What is done is done, but nothing is settled. And if nothing is settled, then everything matters. Every choice, every act, Every new day matters. Every word, every deed is making the meaning of your life and telling the story of the world. Everything matters in the year coming. And more importantly, everything matters today. Yeah, pretty cool reading, eh? So conversation time. If you are new here today, don't freak out. There are no prepared answers. There are no right and wrongs. You know, answer the question in whatever way seems appropriate to you or not at all. But the universe is contained in a single seed. We heard that in our story, the whole expanding universe. And from the reading, as long as you are alive, the meaning of your life is open. So the first question I want you to ask you to consider, and feel free to move the chairs around more. I was trying to be somewhat stylistic and let people still see the screen. And we're not coming back into this, so move however you want. That'll be fine. What principles guide your life? 
Now, our church has seven principles, and that's very nice. And if you don't know them, don't worry about it. Because every one of us, at some point, makes choices about life, about difficult decisions, about something challenging. And usually there is something grounded in the center of our beings that helps us make that decision. So my first question to you, and don't worry if it doesn't line up with anything the church publishes, because this is the church where you're, you're the church, right? So what principle guides you the most when you're thinking about difficult choices? Have a conversation. I'll ring the gong in about five minutes or so and see if the group wants to share anything. All right. I wonder if there are any groups or individuals. This I don't know if this is going to work or not. So uh, is there anybody who has something burning that they want to share or something that came up or something that the whole group seemed to share? Um, we just were commenting on something that I didn't expect us to find, the importance of integrity and uh, owning your shit, so to speak. <laughs> okay. Don't run for political office. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting because the reason I joined the Unitarian faith was that I had freedom. And to me, that said, freedom to do your growth and live your life. Thanks. There you go, Lila's always jumping ahead. That's the next question. <laughs> we were just talking about how our world needs a lot more love. There was a lot more love even a few short years ago, but... We need a lot more love to make this world balanced and harmonious. We had a consensus in this group, I believe, that you must take care of yourself to take care of others. (laughs) Too true. This would be the social justice circle over here. (laughs) You guys have to know that more than anybody else. I think uh, very late in life I've learned that I have to forgive myself. Mm -hmm. And by also, if I have people that, for whatever reason, become belligerent or whatever, I have to let that go and not take that personally. But that's very hard. But do it. (laughs) Okay. Well, you're right. Nobody's going to forgive for you. You have to do it yourself. Basic theological concept. Uh, This is a, a bit about, like, owning my... Oh, uh, shit. Because <laughs> I feel like some, up to now, there has been, like, guiding principles inside me that haven't been really good. And lately, uh, one that I've been really um, using is just realizing how much hate there is in the world. And every time I kind of see it trying to anchor the opposite, trying to just be more loving because, and stopping and being as much loving as I can, because I feel like lots of people out there especially lots of powerful people, they are doing what they're doing and they kind of know that they're doing bad things. And I feel like lots of... I felt very confused my whole life even though I've wanted to be a good person. So I feel like I need to stop being so confused and start really being a good person as often as I can and anchoring love as often as I can. Thank you. Yeah. And we all need food and rest. <laughs> Thank you. Good start. There's a lot of wisdom in the room. This is what's really fun. This, this Communities know what they're about, and that's great. And that's where the next question is coming, is what brought you here? Why are you here? Those of you who have been here a long time, what is it about this place that makes you stick around, makes you want to stay? Where is the strength of this community? Where is its heart? Where is its center? And if you're just coming in new or for the first time or just figuring this out, why did you come today? Or why did you come back today? So go go again. Lively conversations. Anybody want to share on this round? 
What was it that brought you here? What was it? Oh, there. Thanks. So in this group, two things dominated. One was the idea of searching and exploring, challenging our own ideas, listening to other, being open to other ideas. So that was one concept that came up over and over again. The other was Coriolis. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who are new, that is our choir. Then they will be performing next week, and that's a good service to come to. So I know that a lot of people love the idea of the, of the community of our church and the culture, but what really brought me to the church was Ada Nanning. I just like to remember her because she was a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. We had wonderful conversations when I was at the post office, and I couldn't believe how open-minded she was. And that's what brought me to Unitarian Church. Ada Nanning was a member who died, oh, seven, eight years ago now. Wonderful, wonderful woman. So an ex-girlfriend brought me to church. And I just kept coming because the community and the open and honest and the honestly good people that reside in this church just keep me coming back more and more. I look forward to it. I, I want to be here. I just the honestly good people. Can I say I'm honestly good? And I, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be good just for a few minutes, okay? And I honestly believe it. I just uh, shared with my group, I think for the most part we're a group that settles problems without getting into high drama or people quitting and all this kind of thing. It doesn't always happen, but uh, I, I, there's not a lot of anger and p hating people around here. I love that. Agreed. That's one of the things I mentioned in my service last week is one of the reasons why I accepted the call from this congregation was because I saw that it was a very mature organization where people didn't just do the petty power thing. It's very refreshing. And really, I want to stress again, more unique than it ought to be in, uh, in church congregations. The last question is kind of the everything seed question. We're, we're here, we've got this, we've got your principles, we've got your reasons for being here. What's next? What do, what do you hope that this community could burst into? What would you like to see happen next or more or, or more strongly? Anything along those lines. Just what is it that you hope this place will be a year, five, ten years from now? So, what next? What do you think's next? Where does the seed pop open? Where do we go? Anybody with something to share on that? Well, the first thing in our group is both Rosemary and I said, well, we hope the church is here so our memorials can be held here. <laughs> so that's an order. <laughs> But what we, but we, what we actually talked about was the need to have a five generational church, and in those generations we need all races, a mixture of all races and, and whatnot. But we have to, we have to be able to serve all five. And I'm saying five generations because nowadays it's very common to have great grandparents, grandparents, parents, and kids. Is that five? It's four. That's four. Okay. Four. But we are living longer, so you never know. Yeah. And four generations. You need those four generations within the church. And you need things for them. Now, one of the things this we're lacking, I think, is our outreach program to our seniors. We have a lot of seniors in care homes that should have contact at least once a month, and they don't. We need 
support for our parents, and we need to have support for them in raising their children because things are, they're so different now than when I was a parent. And I look at my, I look at my grandchildren who are raising their children, and I think, oh, my God, $2,000 a month for daycare. And, you know, so where do you earn enough money to pay the 2000 per child and still have some income to pay for their education and all of the things? And as a church, we need to be able to support all of those people. Now I'm going to be going on forever, so I'm going to quit. <laughs> Thank you. Well, just going off the earlier question, everybody's talking about how they love to be here because they feel connected and how the feelings of connection with other people who share your values are so important. And, you know, there's a whole world of people out there who are longing for connection. They don't go to a church because they don't believe in a God, and they think that they have to believe in a God in order to go to a church, and they're missing out on what we are enjoying here. And I think that for the future, we need to reach out to the general public and let them know how wonderful things are here in the hopes of bringing them with us by a word of mouth. As Aaron has said, that's the best way to approach people. Thank you. I think that people need a church uh, to uh, their job society requires them to be a member. And so we can be a member for them. Mm -hmm. On a few uh, occasions I've noticed there is a hang-up about, about the word church. Yes. Yes. And if uh, we can find a different word for our community, I think that would be more of inviting. That's yeah. been a conversation that goes around from time to time, from time to time, from time to time. And because it's a legal name, it has to be changed in the bylaws, and that's an annual meeting. So that's a... You can't do it in a Sunday morning discussion. It takes a little more work than that. But you can do it in your interpersonal discussions with other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Any word will do. We're not, you know, it's just we have a legal name, you know. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton doing business as cool Unitarians. In fact, actually, uh, there was a, a group in Saskatoon. They're called the Unitarian Church of Saskatoon. And they've just changed all their branding, and they call themselves Saskatoon Unitarians. And on their legal documents, they're still Unitarian Church, you know, but anyway. Vancouver is making that consideration, too. So, so who knows? We may be germinating something in a petition to the board and coming up in our annual meeting. Wouldn't that be cool? Excellent. Thank you so much for your conversation and your time and your ideas. Richard Jefferies writes, It is eternity now. I am in the midst of it. It is about me in the sunshine. I'm in it as the butterfly in the light-laden air. Nothing has to come. It is now. Now is eternity. Now is the immortal life.